Uh, thank you, everybody uh, who joined us today for this uh, wonderful program that we will start shortly. I am Faisal Saleh. I'm the founder and executive director of the Palestine Museum U.S. in Woodbridge, Connecticut. And that's exactly where we are located today. Um, this is a live uh, event, and uh, uh, we have an uh, audience uh, in-house here, and uh, I will show you some of the people that are here. You guys wave, wave, wave. And, uh, and the rest of the audience are on Zoom and some on Facebook. So uh, at this point, I would like to, you, to introduce uh, Nora Lester Murad, author of the book, Ida in the Middle. And today's event is a book event about that book. And I'm going to turn over the program to Nora, and she will introduce her colleagues who are participating today and sequence through the different segments of the program. Please welcome Nora Lester Morad. I am so incredibly honored that you are all here and the folks on on Zoom as well. When I look over here, I'm looking at the folks on Zoom, but I don't know what it looks like to them. So here we are in these hybrid days. Um, before I introduce the rock star panel for today and the topic, I just wanna tell you a little bit about the book because the story of the book explains why this panel is about Palestinians in schools. It'll make sense to you when I tell you the story. So this book, Ida in the Middle, is my third book, my, my first young adult book, although readers of all ages, I hope, will enjoy it. And Ida is a, an eighth grade Palestinian American girl who's ridiculed and bullied at school and really just wants to disappear and be invisible. I think that is an experience that's quite common for uh, young people in the United States and maybe everywhere. You know, there's that time of life where you feel you don't belong anywhere and no one really sees you and you don't really see yourself either. But as a Palestinian American, Ida also has some unique and special experiences because it's not just that she doesn't fit in, it's that Every time something happens in the Middle East, where she's never even been, the people around her, even kids she grew up with, treat her like a terrorist. So Ida, as a young person, experiences some of the, 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 the cultural and, um, I guess, I want to say, uh, cultural racism that is common in the United States and that is fomented uh, over time through misinformation, misrepresentation, and, and all kinds of stereotyping. Well, Ida does what a lot of us do when she's really stressed out. She stress eats. And she stress eats from a jar of olives that was sent by her mother's family in her Jerusalem village to her mother. And she's just roaming around in the kitchen. She finds these olives. She eats these olives and they transport her to the life she would have had if her parents had never left Palestine. And Palestine is in some ways strangely familiar. She doesn't feel out of place. People do know how to pronounce her name. Nobody treats her like a terrorist. But life is scary for other reasons. Her home and all the homes in her village are under demolition order by Israel. So even though she's in a way more comfortable there, she's also less comfortable there. And when she finds out that it's the olives that transport her from one reality to the other one, she has to choose. She has to choose who she wants to be, where she wants to be, and how she can raise her voice against the injustices in both of her homelands. 
So that is this book, which I, of course, hope you'll buy, but you can also win it in a giveaway. I'll give one away today to someone either in here in person or at home online if you just sign up on the, on the Google form. What surprised me about this book experience is that since it's a young adult book, I said, let's get kids to read this in schools. So I went about about a year long project of speaking with teachers, Palestinian teachers and non-Palestinian teachers and Palestinian students to understand how Palestine is taught in schools in the United States. And what could I do to help this book be used in schools? I found out, as you probably already know, especially those of you who are Palestinian, but even those of you who are not Palestinian, that there are lots and lots of obstacles to teachers to bring Palestine into the classroom. I tried to address some of those obstacles by pulling together uh, curricula, lesson plans, uh, portals, tools, videos, and putting them in a spreadsheet on the teaching resources page on the book's website, but there were still gaps. And so I then started working with a bunch of amazing, mostly Palestinian teachers and writers to fill some of those gaps. And this panel is part of that, trying to generate conversations and tools like webinars that will help teachers to understand the challenges and also the wonderful benefits of bringing Palestine into the classroom for Palestinian kids and for non-Palestinian kids. And so I'm so thrilled to have literally, like I said, a rock star panel of Palestinian educators who can speak from their own experience in US schools as students and from their experience as teachers in US schools, as well as curriculum designers and teacher educators. So um, that is my little long intro. Two of us are in person today, me and my wonderful colleague, Luma Hassan, and two of our colleagues are virtual, which hopefully you can see on the screen. They are Sausen Javer and Mona Mustafa. Uh, Sausen is in Chicago right now, yes, and Mona is in New Jersey, yes. Okay, you never know where people are. What I wanna do is um, I will ask a question, um, first of all, to Sausen, let me introduce her, ask her um, question. Please unmute yourselves. And then um, I will pose a similar question, introduce the next person, pose a question, introduce the next person, pose a question. And as you folks in person or online have questions, please note them. Uh, there'll be time to for you to ask questions from the people and also for folks to just post their questions in the chat, which FISA will, uh, will manage and moderate, right? So I'm going to start with Sausan. Um, let me introduce you. Uh, Dr. Sausan Jevid is a global educator with 20, over 20 years of experience. She cur currently teaches English at East Layden High School in Franklin Park, Illinois. As founder of Education Unfiltered Consulting, Sausan works with schools around the country on curriculum mapping, strategic planning, custom tailoring, a social justice curriculum for schools, and anti-bias training. She's on the board of Our, Vo Our Voice Alliance, OVA, which is charged with amplifying the voices of teachers of color to create more equity for students of color and is the founder of the Arab American Education Network. Sousan's research, which you'll hear about, focuses on engaging students in equity work and advocating for Arab and Muslim students. So my first question is uh, for you, Sousan. Um, you grew up as a Palestinian in the US. If you could tell us where you grew up and what it was like for you and in that, uh, of course, introduce yourself and your own lived experiences with the challenges and the joys and how that led you to teaching. Thank you for having me on this panel. I'm honored to speak to all of you. Um, I don't even know where to start with that question. I was thinking about it earlier because there's just so much. Um, and so I grew up in Brooklyn. That's my earliest years. And I think that's the first 
time where I realized that being Palestinian was a question mark in America, even in the, in the, in the 80s. Um, I remember in third grade uh, being given a thumbtack to go and put on our country of origin and not being able to find Palestine in that place and having a teacher who didn't understand my confusion or understand why that was such a perplexing moment for me as a Palestinian. Um, I'm from Dedi Yassin, and so we grew up listening to stories of the Nakba and survival um, from my grandfather and from my parents who are uh, who grew up in refugee camps. Um, so I've my grandfather was a Nakba survivor, my parents Nexa survivors, my great grandmother fought in the war and the massacre of Dedi Yassin in 1948, as did my grandfather. So you can only imagine that we were extremely Palestinian, uh, you know, because as, as refugees, I think in general, uh, people tend to hold on to their identities stronger because that's all you have left when you're displaced. And I think that holds very true to Palestinians of the diaspora internationally, that we hold very, very close to the culture as a form of resistance and to the, the things that make us Palestinian. Um, so language was very important, cultural, cultural uh, holding on to our culture was very important. And we went to school carrying all of that as an intersection of I our identity, even though we had never actually visited Palestine uh, physically until we were adults. It didn't make us, it didn't make a difference. We couldn't love Palestine or be any more Palestinian. Um, and I can say honestly that regardless of the places I've lived, because I went from Brooklyn to New Jersey, from New Jersey to Abu Dhabi, and, and from Abu Dhabi to Illinois, and in all of those places, being Palestinian was an intersection that was problematic in a lot, a lot of different ways in every single one of those contexts, including Abu Dhabi. Um, so I think, and now as a professional, and, and you mentioned all the different positions, positionality that we are speaking as Palestinians from a teacher perspective, from a teacher leader perspective, as a child, as a student, now as a teacher, but also as a parent. And watching your children go through things as a parent and, and understanding how educational systems function has been a really one of the biggest challenges. I think that's really um, kind of pushed me into and propelled me into doing a lot of the work that I've been doing and asking a lot of the questions that I've been asking um, within my research and in my focus on my in my doctorate, uh, really trying to fill a research gap and elevate the voices of Palestinian students in schools that nobody, no, there's no work on that in that area because like everything else, the Palestinian narrative is intentionally erased in every possible way. And if it's not erased, it's misrepresented grossly to create a, a level of fear. And that does come from the fact that there is bipartisan support, obviously, for uh, Israel. And so no matter how much we try to advocate for Palestine, due to the lack of information that's at the fingertips of people's hands, I think it's really hard to, to get. And, and I always like quote Angela Davis in her book, From Ferguson to Palestine. She says, even the most progressive equity advocates, when it comes to Palestine, for some reason, there's a red line. And in my work with OVA and in my work with all of these different uh, organizations and the different hats that I wear, the different professional leader, leadership networks that I, that I function through, I've learned that that is very true. If I post about equity for any other group on Twitter, on Facebook, on anywhere, if I'm speaking in a conference and I've spoken in 27 <laughs> conferences in the last six months, <laughs> I think you can speak to anything and get so much support. The minute you say Palestine, there's silence. And so that just speaks to the fear that people have, the lack of information that people have in general. And I always say that schools are the place that can disrupt inequity across the board because education is our liberation. And so once we can start to figure out how to include this narrative with fidelity and authenticity in our schools, then we can start to see people changing towards, changing their attitudes and just understanding what that looks like, what, what being Palestinian really means versus a single story that's out there that is really perpetuated by the people who are telling our story and it's not us who are telling our story currently. We are not the authors of our own story and that's a really big problem in how we're viewed internationally in, in the world. Thank you so much for that. I'm so glad that Faisal, you've offered us the opportunity for the Palestinians to tell their story themselves and not just in this event today, but in the museum and all the events that you do. It's really phenomenal and, and opens up space that has not been there and is not enough anyway, but it's better than nothing. Um, Mona, let me introduce you. Um, Mona Mustafa is a Palestinian educator born in the United States. A graduate of Rutgers University, she majored in political science and international affairs with a concentration in Middle Eastern studies. She went on to become a certified teacher through Rutgers University's Urban Teacher Education Program. Uh, Mona has been a teacher for the past 10 years, working primarily in El Ghazali High School, a private Islamic school based in Wayne, New Jersey. 
This summer, she taught in the I Know I Can Summer Academy at Ramallah Friends School in Palestine. She's currently working as a high school teacher of history and Arabic language and culture in Patterson, New Jersey. And uh, Muna, if you could just, um, on, on the subject of growing up as a Palestinian, uh, in being a Palestinian American in schools, um, what would you like to add to uh, either affirm or, or differ from or add to the story that Sousan has begun? Well, first, I want to just thank you uh, for having me. I'm very honored to be with everyone and to be a part of uh, this program today. Um, and when it comes to my upbringing as a Palestinian American and as a student, um, my roots are pretty much uh, based based with within my family, right? Mm -hmm. It all starts with my grandfather, who's who was seen um, in our small village, which is called Mukhmas in the West Bank as one of the trailblazers, one of the first people who made that journey out of Palestine and came to America and pretty much raised his family. So my mother is actually born and raised in America. My father is um, from uh, born and raised in Palestine and made the journey here after. So watching my, my mother and her siblings grow up, um, I'm the first of 30 grandchildren. So I, you know, my whole life has just been watching my mother, watching my grandfather raise his children here, and then becoming a teacher myself and, and you know, a Palestinian American growing up here. Um, it's been pretty amazing to watch, you know, the growth of a Palestinian family, right? Um, so he, my grandfather being the first one to actually push for his daughters to go to college and become educators, they were the inspiration for me, right? Uh, they were, they, my mother is, is a principal and a teacher, my aunt, my uncles, so many of them became educators with the, with the push from my grandfather, right? Because he, from that many years ago, he kind of saw that, like uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Javid said right now, that education is the tool for liberation, right? And it was amazing that from, you know, the 20s and the 30s, you know, somebody thinking that far ahead, right? Uh, seeing the future. So I kind of feel like a sense of responsibility now as a teacher and a mother to bring my roots into any classroom that I go to. Um, so when it comes to the question of, you know, where do, do I see myself as a student? Uh, so Ms. Dr. Javid was actually one of the first teachers I've had in El Ghazali. And she was one of the, the first ones who I felt began to expose us to uh, you know, equity and to the idea of liberation and, and learning and teaching about the Palestinian struggle. Because before that, even though it was an Islamic school, a private school, and we had lots of freedoms when it came to what books that the teachers could introduce into the classroom, I felt that my knowledge of Palestine was lacking. I didn't really get a, a full education on, you know, the Nekba, the Nexa, all of these pivotal moments in our history until I began uh, to get exposed to teachers like Dr. Sosen. Uh, and she is actually one of the hugest inspirations I've had in my life. Uh, and the reason why I also feel such an obligation to incorporate Palestine into every classroom. And th this year being very different since it's the first time that I'm actually in a public school among non-Palestinians. My entire life or my entire teaching career, I've been with my own people. And I've been able to openly speak about my trips to Palestine, that my family would take us every other summer and do their best to connect us. Um, my grandparents, before they passed away, um, sitting under the, the, grape tree, the grapevine and hearing my grandmother's stories and how she let her sons leave her to come to this country, you know, and build their lives. So uh, pretty much all of these are the things that are ingrained um, in my heart. And I try to really um, put them into my lessons when I speak to my students, whether they be Palestinian or non-Palestinian, because I feel like our story is a human story. So uh, especially if it's rooted in family, everybody understands what family is. Everyone can uh, understand why a grandfather or a grandmother is a role model. So if you speak about uh, your own family members and their experiences and humanize our story, uh, it becomes a lot easier to get through. So that's how I feel about it. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. Uh, 
it's reminding me over the course of my career as somebody who's done a lot of anti-racism, they now call it diversity, equity, and inclusion, but I call it anti-racism work, is the double burden that people of color face when they are um, in professional roles, having to, to bear the extra burden, you know, of, uh, of not just uh, teaching Palestine, but being Palestinian and feeling that obligation to do more than what a non-Palestinian teacher would have to do. Um, so I really, I really uh, hear and ad admire that. Uh, I'd like to introduce to my left, um, Luma Hassan. Luma is a Palestinian American activist, um, a New Jersey public schools social studies educator, and thank goodness, a curriculum specialist. For over seven years, she's been teaching and providing curriculum and professional development resources centered around anti-bias, anti-racist, liberation, and decolonizing frameworks. She's also led and facilitated student-centered youth participatory action research programs throughout central New Jersey. Um, the, to fuel the fight for solidarity and collective liberation, Lum is also an avid baker, plant collector, and DIY enthusiast. I that part in there. <laughs> what was that? I forgot I left that part in there. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's in here. Sorry, it's in here. And um, the reason why I say thank goodness she's a curriculum developer is because Luma and her partner are developing a six-week curriculum for this book so that uh, teachers who want to teach Ida in the middle have like a scaffolding lesson plans and background information they can follow to to introduce um, Ida in the middle in school. So I'm so happy about that. Um, since you're also uh, a Palestinian American who grew up in U.S. schools, do you have anything to add to the idea about what it's like for Palestinian students? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's interesting to hear um, Mona share her experience. It's, it's, it feels like mine are so different, and I actually have never really thought about Palestinian American students who are surrounded by other Palestinians um, and how different that might be. So I grew up in New Jersey um, in what ended up being a very Zionist community, um, unintentionally. That's not where we intended to end up. Um, but my parents both immigrated here. My mom grew up uh, in the West Bank in Nablus, and my father grew up uh, in Jordan, both experiencing um, their own experiences of uh, discrimination and isolation with Palestinians over there as well. Um, so everything I knew about being Palestinian came from my family because there was nowhere else to get it from. Um, so it's obviously that brings about a lot of pride because you're learning it from the people that are closest to you in your life. You're learning it from your family overseas um, and developing this like massive love and joy um, and admiration for the resilience of your own people. Um, so that's why for me, a lot of my experiences in school and in engaging with teachers uh, and students was trying to share that pride with other people um, and being met in, I guess, one of three ways. One being people not knowing what Palestine is and asking me if I'm Pakistani or Indian or not really understanding the geographic location that I was actually from. Um, you will also get a kind of Orientalist reaction from folks who, you know, it's, you, do you need saving as a Muslim woman, right? That conflation of, of Muslim and Palestinian identity um, or a, an accusation of terrorism and an expectation to defend whether or not myself or my people or my family are terrorists. Um, and then the third one, which was people who were staunchly Zionist, even as like middle schoolers, um, who would demand and expect an answer and a response and apology from me as a Palestinian, um, as young as like the seventh grade. Um, so that was pretty much my entire relationship with trying to share and make those connections with myself to others was really met with those three categories. Um, truthfully, as an adult, it's pretty much still those three. There's obviously pockets a little bit more now of people who actually respond to that pride with like a pride in return. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the norm. So those were kind of the three experiences that, that I had, um, which is why it was so important to me to be able to work on this curriculum with Nora, because having those opportunities to connect identity to self in school is so important. Um, and for it to be shut down for me so much as a student, even from teachers, um, made it really hard to even understand my own self. Um, like even in trying to connect 
and social studies class, right? Make a connection to the Trail of Tears and learning about that in social studies, saying to my classroom and to, to my peers in that class, oh, that's like what my grandparents experienced in 1948 when they were kicked out of their homes in Palestine. To have a teacher say to an entire audience of who were my friends and peers and classmates, no, that's not what happened to you or your family. Um, and having to grow up with that and take that and wrestle with the like contradictions of those experiences, um, that's what really read, led me into specifically social studies education, right? And, and teaching that truth and teaching that reality, not just for Palestine, um, but for these uh, fabrications of people's histories of marginalized histories that exist all throughout US curriculums. So that's me. <laughs> I actually kind of want to cry, honestly. Um, you know, I'm not Palestinian, but um, I have three Palestinian daughters. So through them, I, uh, I'm still a white person with all of the biases and limitations of my own experience. But um, being a mother of Palestinians has definitely um, exposed me and helped me to understand levels of racism that I could not have otherwise seen. And one of them was uh, very much uh, the experience you just talked about, one of my daughters in the 11th grade talked about feeling uncomfortable in her school for many reasons, including because so many kids were wearing Israeli Defense Forces uh, t-shirts and sweatshirts. Um, the IDF, uh, she calls it the merch line, you know, IDF hats, IDF water bottles, IDF backpacks. And this was really hard for her um, because she actually grew up in the West Bank under occupation. Um, I raised all of the three, my husband, and I raised our three girls there, and then um, two of them graduated from Ramallah, and the youngest one came to the United States in the ninth grade. So this was in the 11th grade, where she went to the school and said, you know, I'm not comfortable, and the school is not very diverse, and I can't figure out where I belong, and they told her, you're wrong. This is a great school. We're very anti-racist. And you are so lucky you're not at that school because we are awesome and amazing. And just like having a person say what their own personal experience is and being told you're wrong is, it, it really takes my breath away that that's happening and continues um, to happen. So I'd like to ask Sosan uh, a follow up question to you because you not only had the experience of growing up a couple years ago, not too many, but a couple years ago in the United States as a Palestinian, but you're also researching what it's like for Palestinian students today. So before we shift to the educator hat, if you could just talk from your research point of view about how is it different or not for Palestinian kids today than it was in the past. I think the question that I always ask is what happens when you immerse students in stereotypical images of themselves? And I think feel like Lama and even Muna to a certain degree kind of answered to that question because at the end of the day, that's actually what's happening to our students in, in classrooms, right? As the world kind of post-George Floyd and post-COVID focuses so much on what equity looks like in a public school classroom for all other identities. I always say the voice that's constantly missing even in equity spaces is what it looks like for Arab students in general. And like Luma said, the conflation of those identities, very few people in America, and this is something that I've noticed from inter interviewing teachers and even parents for the work that I've been doing in my research to try to get gauge an understanding of where our educators are in their understandings of Palestinian identities, of Arab identities, of Muslim identities, very few know the difference between all of those different identities. And I think that's part of the design of the inequity that's that's really geared towards our kids. In my consulting work, I even have been faced with contracts that say, if you even mention Palestine, you are going to be fined an X amount of dollars. So that's the intentionality be behind keeping this narrative out of equity spaces, out of school, school curriculum, out of you know, in every space that you can possibly make that difference and create those mirrors and those windows mirrors of our students to see themselves represented accurately and windows for other people to be able to understand those identities accurately are there's a there's an actual barrier of of limitations with clauses of limitations with curriculum of limitations of not wanting to rock the boat with other parents who are anti that narrative being taught in schools of limitations with regards to self advocacy from the Arab and Palestinian communities and so what you see is I feel like 
with all the students that I've interviewed in for my dissertation, the Palestinian students are always the most not hesitant. There's a Palestinian pride among Palestinians, but I think at adolescent ages, naturally there is a need for kids to want to fit and belong in the communities that they take space in. And that's their school community. A lot of kids are spending more time in school during the day than they are at home. And so what happens is that they just want to fit. And so almost 100% of the kids that I interviewed for my research changed their names, even when they were talking to me and they knew that I was somebody who could understand their name and, and pronounce their name and kind of that representation. They were happy to talk to me about their identities, their intersections of their identity, including, including being Palestinian. But in conversations, these are kids who were purposely and intentionally hiding those indicators that made them different with their peers around them and only associated themselves in ways that they were similar. And in communities where there's not a lot of them, that, was, that often meant that they had to create the sense of duality where they were one person in school that fit in with everybody else and another person out of school that was proud of and kind of owned their, their different intersections of their identities very proudly. And that became very tedious for them. Um, and when talking to teachers, it was very evident that looking at these students, many of these students presented very successful with the markers that we use to measure students success wise. They were doing well in school, um, they were engaged in extracurricular activities. And so based on the definitions of inclusion and belonging that we use to measure students and to measure our success in being inclusive, which is a farce, I think, in a lot of schools, because we look at things externally and we're, we're often looking at quantitative data, not qualitative data, where we can elevate stories of particular students and different identities. These kids look like they're fine. But the reality was when you were talking to them, the intentionality and the effort and the work that was being, that was kind of promoting this plural and linguistic, the, their diversity was like being put on the side and they had this, the sense of double consciousness that was being created where they felt like they had to take on dual personalities and dual personas in different spaces, depending on who they were talking to. And then to top that off with the fact that there's a lack of representation in administration and in educators in general, where they can see mirrors of themselves and feel like they can connect to people who are in positions of power in buildings, all kind of contributed to the fact that they felt like they couldn't be who they were. And there's so much research that talks about the implications of academic performance and how, how detrimental it is for students to not feel like they, they're, they're included and that they belong fully. Um, the question marks that creates. And so you either saw students kind of being recluse and just keeping into themselves and really just doing school well and learning how to do school well and say they were great students on paper and with grades, but not when it came to their feelings about owning their identity and who they were, or you had students who, because of uh, part parents' kind of requirements of being a certain way and dressing a certain way and, and acting a certain way, and, and their push to really hold on to that culture, came to school with a change of clothes in their backpack and were completely different people when they came to school, or you had kids who really just felt like they weren't going to even bother because they felt like no matter how much they tried, no matter what they did, I mean, kind of like sharing stories. My daughter was made to apologize in front of her class for 9-11. And I remember even like in, in, in speeches and in protests and in teachings that we do in school, many people come back and say, well, you know, let Palestinians die. They deserve to die after everything that happened with 9-11. Again, the conflation of identities, but when they look at us, they see terrorists. They don't understand the differences. And that's the only story that they're being exposed to. I think with regards to, is it different? Yes, it is different because now we have social media. And I think social media is a double-edged sword because what it's doing is it's exposing the realities of what's happening in Palestine in real time to a lot of people who have never seen that. Um, and I think that's presenting a different narrative to a lot of people who know now more of what the truth looks like in reality if they want to but it's also promoting the hate and the lies at the same time. And that becomes what a lot of people who refuse to own the narrative and really listen to it and understand it, or even give it a chance to survive in a school space or in an educational space, they hold on to that. And oftentimes that's what our kids are being exposed to and immersed in, in schools. And so I think, I think the advent of social media and the impacts and the ease of information at people's fingertips allows people who want to know the truth access to the truth in a lot of different ways that weren't around when we were growing up in schools, but it also allows them to that false information and the false media that is being used to elevate fear. And I always tell my students, whenever we elevate fear, what happens is we have a, a, like a, a lack of rationale. The fear takes over and people aren't thinking anymore. And I think that's what's happening when it comes to a lot of Arab and Muslim identities. And then to top it all off, the fact that we can't even really advocate for Arabs in general because we're not on the census and all of the mandates, the 
um, the funding, all of the like the ESSA requirements, the national ESSA requirements for schools to receive funding focus on subgroups. And so when we're looking at subgroups, the fact that we are considered white in, in that subgroup as an Arab population, we're invisible. As Palestinians, we're absolutely invisible because of how contentious that identity is. And so even when we're trying to talk about Arab students, unless they're falling in ELL or, or, um, or special needs like kind of subcategories, they're absolutely invisible in the conversation of when it comes when it comes to supports that they need, how do we actually help them to feel included? How do we bring in like even in parent advisory committees or other things that are mandated by the, the state and by the nation in order for us to be more inclusive, there's no requirement for us to include those voices in there. And then you have the final layer, which is we are not self-advocates, not yet, not as far, not as much as we need to be. And so our voice demanding that we our voice is being heard in places where we have rights and laws to have our voices heard, that's not happening. And so we've kind of stepped away and allowed other people to tell our story for us. And, and that's often, again, the story of the more powerful. I always say it's the hunter and the lion. So we're hearing the story of the hunter. We're never hearing the story of the lion. And so we're, our voice is constantly missing. Um, so I would say yeah, it, the, the misrepresentation and the misunderstanding stands the same across the board. But I think I always say now, even when I'm presenting in front of teachers or talking to my own students about social justice curriculum and integrate Palestine everywhere um, that I can, I always say that if we don't know today, it's because we choose not to know. And the sad truth is that a lot of people choose not to know just because even if they believe that we have the right to have our voice elevated and heard, there's so much tension and there's just so much red tape when you take that voice on. I say it's professional suicide. And if you decide to take on that, that role of being the advocate and really elevating that voice, you are making choices as a professional about whether you, you choose to elevate your career or not. And I can speak to that personally. So it definitely is it, you have to be prepared for a fight and push back in a lot of different ways if you choose to integrate that with fidelity in a classroom space or in a school space in general. Yeah, and, and I, 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 I'm so grateful for all of that that you're sharing. It's really deep. I have a feeling that um, the Palestinians who are here in person or online and non-Palestinians can relate to a lot of what you're talking about. And it's it's something that was important to me when I wrote Ida in the middle is that uh, not only Palestinian kids, but non-Palestinian kids would also be able to relate to some of the challenges that she's going through. And also that her uh, her journey is, is not only a cultural journey, because that is very important, but it's also a political journey. It's her finding her voice as a, as a truth teller and as an advocate, not only for herself, but for her people. And that coming to that strength, which she comes to by connecting with her own heritage is something that she can grow into and then become a model for other people. Um, can I piggyback off of that just for a second really quick? Because the importance of that is not just important for our children as, pa as Palestinians in school. I always say it's just as important for the non-Palestinian kids because when you have that strength and identity and you have that proper representation, and that's why I'm all for, like, instead of us trying to get books approved by school boards with a time of book banning and CR anti-CRT, we need to focus on really elevating student voices as content creators instead of content consumers because when our kids are creating that content with pride and identity and a resolute ground like foundation of who they are and, and they're they're proud regardless and despite then that often becomes a window for other students to learn about their experiences and their identities whether teachers choose to take on that work or not they're learning from each other in classroom communities and so it's not just important for our kids to feel included it's just as important for them to feel included and for that voice to be elevated because in a learning space kids are learning from each other all day long and so that's a dismantling of that stereotypical one-sided story as well it, it's so true i think a little bit later we should talk also about how important this is not only for Palestinian kids, but for non-Palestinian kids. We'll talk about that exclusive, you know, focus on that. Um, but let me um, let me pose the next question to you, Mona, if you don't mind. Um, as an educator now, so still a Palestinian, still someone who grew up here, but focusing on your education uh, lens and, and experience, can you talk about what being knowledgeable about and connected to Palestine means in the identity development and self-esteem of Palestinian American kids? And what mechanisms and tools can be used to help Palestinian American kids 
develop a healthy sense of themselves in U.S. schools. Okay, that's uh, piggybacking off of what Luma and what Dr. Sosan said. Um, feeling marginalized your whole life, growing up in schools, feeling like you can't really use your voice as strongly as you wanted to, um, that is detrimental, right? Uh, but what, what, what our job is as teachers is to kind of empower the students to say, yes, it's going to be difficult to speak up, and, and yes, you might get some pushback, but we have so many valid points that we can use, right? We can have, what we can create for our students is almost like a toolkit for responding to hate or responding to, no, not Palestinian, everything else but Palestinian, right? Because we have so many, uh, you know, people in our, uh, in Palestinian literature, poets, artists, uh, even musicians, so many different uh, categories that you could use as a Palestinian American um, to kind of take pride in your identity, right? So to, to build yourself back up after years of that suppression in schools. Um, so this, you know, people like Linda Sarsour and others who use the term unapologetically Palestinian, that's kind of like the, 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 the way that we should kind of uh, move into the direction. Um, I had an experience this summer because this was after 12 years of not going back to Palestine. Um, I was, you know, a, a teenager the last time I went, and this time I went as a, a Palestinian adult, a mother, a teacher. Um, so you could only imagine all of the pride that I had about, wow, I'm going to Palestine this summer, right? Um, and when I was asked by another passenger on the plane, where are you going? And I said, I simply said to the passenger, I'm going to Palestine. Uh, the reaction I got from other uh, people who were in the airplane was just shocking to me. I know, I, I guess, uh, you know, maybe the sheltering that I had experienced being in a private school, being in a majority Palestinian American, Arab American community, I didn't realize the extent to which, you know, just the word Palestine would have on, on somebody who uh, doesn't believe the same way that I do. Uh, so these people on the plane were kind of talking, oh, she, look how she says and disregards where she really is going. Doesn't she know she's going to Israel? Doesn't she, you know, the, the usage of the word, it was so painful for me. It was so painful. And that was the beginning of my trip to Palestine. So I, it kept reverberating in my mind. And when I met um, the Palestinian students that I worked with, um, they, were, they were refugees. They were coming from Shafat refugee camp. Um, and even those who lived in Ramallah their whole lives, they they still knew that you know their their roots were uh, as refugees coming to Ramallah because they couldn't stay in their villages. Um, I used that and I told my students about that, right? Um, and so I pretty much told them, yes, it hurt me, and I I uh, the way I responded to that passenger on the plane was, yes, I am going to Palestine, and I and I could show you, uh, you know, my family's home. I could show you our olive trees. I could show you so much that is going to prove to you that's where I was, you know? Um, so even though it's scary to respond, even though it's like your, your voice is shaking, you still have to use it. So th that's the kind of advice that I would give my students who are Palestinian American. And right now out of a hundred students um, in Patterson, which I thought, you know, taking this job in Patterson, um, I thought that it wouldn't be as challenging to be a Palestinian American teacher. Uh, because if you guys know of, of Patterson, New Jersey, it's it's the second largest Palestinian population. It has a street sign that's called Palestine Way because of all the businesses and the pride that everyone had. And even though this school that I'm in right now is a block away from Palestine Way, it was shocking to me that they didn't know that, like Luma said, they, if I was telling them about Palestine, oh, Pakistan, where is that? Uh, they They had no idea. So, uh, you know, we, we really do have to start from scratch. And for those five out of 100 Palestinian American kids that I had, um, I'm teaching them and, and their peers uh, pretty much that it is, you, you do have to be unapologetic and that you have so much to take pride in. Um, and pretty much if we, we, you know, we start opening up their eyes to these, um, you know, poets, our national poets, I took the students on a virtual tour of uh, pretty much the Mahmoud Darwish Museum to show them like, look at the, these leaders that you have as role models. You have so many role models. You're a good writer, this is a good writer. 
you're an artist, here's, a, here's an amazing artist for you to admire or to look up to, right? Um, and when it came to non-Palestinian students, um, if they had a little inch of knowledge, I kind of took that, uh, took advantage of that. So one of my students, she, uh, she was speaking about how she admired Banksy art, right? So then I kind of showed them, you know, images of the apartheid wall and the different art that's available to them. So make connections to things that they have interests in and then um, just show them that there really is so much talent in the Palestinian community for them to piggyback off of. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a question from the audience um, from uh, Michael Goodman. He says, uh, where did this incident of making a student apologize for 9-11 take place? Uh, what if any disciplinary action was taken against the teacher and the district involved? Uh, I suspect it took place many, many, many places. But where did that specific one that you're talking about take place, um, Sosa? So it happened in my kids' school district here in Illinois, and it's a district that has about 38% Arab, particularly Palestinian. Uh, we are the largest Palestinian and Arab community in the country right now. So I think, Mona, you're number two, we're number one. And despite the fact that they have a 600% growth of kids who look like my daughter in school every single year, um, they are not doing any work to meet their needs. So Orland Park, Illinois, and no, no action whatsoever, because the response that I got back was this teacher has been around forever, and we have never had an issue with her. She was retiring the following year. She was an older white woman. And and it was brushed under the rug, despite the fact that we advocated with all of the things that we know we're going to advocate for. But the, the hierarchy all the way up to the superintendent was very defensive of her actions. And so we were powerless. Mm -hmm. So I can tell personally, I could just listen to these people all day long because it's. But it's a bit hard. I'm not saying it's not hard to listen to you. It's hard, but. Um, you're amazing. We do need to shift to non-Palestinian students, but before we do that, um, Luma, what what are your thoughts about the the ways that we can support the identity development of Palestinian American and kids? Um, anything that might be additional or different than what yeah. the others have mentioned? Um, I think the most important thing is. I mean, first, there's a level of honesty that needs to be had about what it means to teach about Palestine in schools. Um, like speaking to what Sosan said about um, this like professional suicide of taking Palestine on as a teacher. Um, I mean, I took that on and it and it led me to leave the school that I was in um, because of the immediate kind of uh, shutdown of my voice entirely that happened in the school district that I was in for attempting to even um, meaningfully bring it into the classroom. Um, so that being said, in order to get to that point where you can actually have these conversations and not have this kind of um, attack on Palestinian teachers specifically, but teachers in general who want to have these conversations, is having a supportive community in that school um, of teachers, even if it's just a few, right? And in this case, I don't know how many educators are in this um, webinar or in this room or future educators, but um, particularly teachers that hold a level of privilege in the school um, that can protect other teachers that are trying to do this work. Um, for me, that was actually one of the only ways that I felt comfortable having these conversations with my students, um, even though they were so eager to learn about Palestine and understand the reality of, of what was happening, the truth about what was happening, um, in order to understand me better as their teacher, but also to understand all the news that they were seeing and stuff they were seeing on social media. Um, Having that and having other teachers who were willing to also have these conversations with students with me, so at least there was some solidarity, right? They couldn't fire all of us all at once. Um, that gave me strength. Before that, I was not having those conversations all. I was terrified. Um, so I think that piece is really, really crucial, um, even in small numbers. Uh, and I also think in terms of the identity development of Palestinian students, it really is about those windows and mirrors, um, being able to see yourself, see others um, make those connections of identity to yourself within the curriculum, but also having those validated, right? In my case, it was not. It was completely dismissed when I tried to connect my own identity to the curriculum. Um, simple acts like that go a long way, right? It's not always going to be in a teacher's curriculum to be able to teach about the entire history of Palestine, right? If you're a, a you know, a science teacher, you're not, you don't have that space. Um, but you do have space to validate students' identity always in the classroom, and that obviously needs to apply to Palestinian students. Um, but when it does come to actually teaching about Palestine, 
Um, the reality of what that looks like right now is kind of what we've been saying about that either entire dismissal of Palestinians completely, um, or what we see very frequently is a kind of both sides peace talks type of lesson, right? Like you guys sit on this side and you guys sit on this side, you're the Palestine side, you're the Israeli side, have a debate. And that's really as complicated as it gets in a lot of US public schools if teachers are willing to broach those topics. Um, so the other piece that's important for teachers who are trying to have these conversations and um, be thoughtful to their Palestinian students in the room, but also just to Palestinians in general and to you know fighting for uh, global justice in general is to not fall into this narrative of equating both sides, equating colonizer and colonized. Um, and you can apply that to all different parts of our history, history curriculums. Um, but in this case, that's what is constantly still happening, even though we know that it's not an acceptable thing to do in other cases, right? When students are learning about American history or they're, when they're learning about um, colonialism and they're learning about Christopher Columbus, it's more common now to understand that there's a, a power difference in colonizer versus colonized. That doesn't happen for Palestinians. So by extension, then you have Palestinian students who are trying to defend themselves against an argument that is not reality to them or to their families. Um, so they can't even engage in those conversations at all without being forced to apologize for, for resisting their ex own extermination. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I can't tell you how much I, I agree with that even though I'm, I'm I'm not a teacher in schools, but the the um, the teaching of, of 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 the conflict we say in quotes because it's not a good word for it, but the teaching of that um, as as if it's a misunderstanding, either a religious misunderstanding or a cultural misunderstanding, is so problematic. Um, if we start from the beginning and say this is a matter of, of settler colonialism, it's structural inequality, then we realize you would never have, let's say, a, de a debate between the slave owners and the slaves. You would never do that. You'd never say, you do the slave owner side, you do the slave side. It would be ridiculous, right? It should be that ridiculous to talk about two sides. But in addition to that, as someone who's not only non-Palestinian, but also Jewish, I think the two sides equation is so problematic because it pits all Jews together against not even all Palestinians, but all Arabs, okay? So once that happens, once they frame it as a two sides issue, then any gain on the Palestine side comes at the expense of Jews. And then there's a logical self-defense. Don't take that away from me, right? As opposed to understanding that there are actually many sides and that the side of peace and justice benefits everybody. Nobody loses when Palestinian rights are respected, when Palestinian dignity, when Palestinian, when Palestine itself is protected as a place, as a history, as a heritage, as a, as a, a national group, um, that is a plus gain for everybody. Um, and so the two sides problem, sorry, I just hopped on your bandwagon, <laughs> such a problem. Um, Mona, real, real quickly, a follow-up to you, but, but quickly, because I'm talking too much. Um, a couple of books, because you, we all love books, but what are a couple of books that you use or, or, or recommend that we all use to support Palestinian kids in schools? Um, I would say that we could choose a few uh, based on level. Uh, would you like to focus on like th the different levels or just the ones yeah. that I've used myself? Well, um, I have young children. So I have a 10 year old, a seven year old and a two year old. So when it comes to the children's books, I'm trying to really build up that self-esteem from a young age with them. Um, so for, for the two-year-old, I'm using P is for Palestine. So if you're using, if you're talking about letters in general, every, every child is learning their letters, right? So you could teach a book like P is for Palestine uh, to your own children. Maybe not so if you're a first grade teacher, maybe, you know, I know that P is for Palestine has some issues or some bans on it. So I don't know how uh, how it would be incorporated into a first grade classroom in certain districts, right? It's based on the, the districts that you're working in at this point. Um, there's one that I really love 
um, and it would be more for, you know, like a 10 year old or older. And that one is called Baba, what does my name mean? Um, and with that one, it's kind of like a journey through Palestine. So for kids who have never been able to go, this book is kind of like a mini adventure through the different cities and that teach you the different uh, trademarks that each city has. Like if you go to Nablus and the Knafa, and if you go to Bethlehem and you'll see the, the Church of Nativity and all these different um, beautiful parts that you know can really just enter the children at a young age and build up their self-esteem or their identity. So I feel like you know that's what my mother did with me, and that's what I'm trying to, you know, keep going um, as we as we grow. Um, when it comes to young adult or um, ch you know the, the the middle schoolers that I taught, I I used a book called Tasting the Sky. And I used a graphic novel. So now we have, we're so lucky at this point because we do have so many new authors coming up um, who are so talented and who really do tell you the story and the history in a way that's relatable. So there's Bedawi. This one is a graphic novel and it's really, it's an eye opener. Uh, the, it's a black and white and the images are like comic style. So you can really get the story of 1948 um, and 1967 in that one, um, if you want to teach the history and build the identity as well. Um, it's also connected to the to art through um, Handala, the figure of Handala, this representative of the refugee, which is like pretty much 5 million refugees or upwards of 5 million can see themselves through a, a book like this. And children in America who uh, who come with, you know, a privilege of, you know, not having to experience this uh, exile or this displacement uh, firsthand can really get that in a book like Beddawi um, and their memoirs. So if, you know, if we're teaching in teaching non-Palestinian children, we want to pretty much teach memoir. Let's say we're in, in an English classroom and you're teaching memoir. You can use excerpts from a book like Tasting the Sky or images from a book like Beddawi. Um, and then when you go into the older grades, I would say for me, um, uh, Mornings in Janine was a really teachable moment for me and um, Salt Houses. I felt like Salt Houses kind of exposed me to diaspora, right? Uh, and a psychological viewpoint of diaspora, what happens over the years to multiple members of the family who go in so many directions. But still at the end of the day, you still have that identity that's rooting everybody together so those uh i can i can probably write them down in the chat for, for anybody who needs that amazing thank you so much so there's one question left uh before uh we get to the q a for the folks on zoom as well as i hope you're keeping your comments in your minds and this is about uh non-palestinian kids um, can each of you, starting with Luma, can you talk about why it's important for them to learn about Palestine in schools? And what are the challenges to bringing Palestine in classrooms so that all kids can learn? That's yeah. a big question. <laughs> that make sense. <laughs> Maybe focus on why it's important. Yeah. Um, Palestine is a really um interesting way for students to really understand intersectionality and understand like global solidarity and what that looks like. Um, I think it's an important gateway and it has been for students in my classroom to really understanding the U.S.'s role in ongoing um, colonialism in Palestine, um, what the actual like motivations of the United States are, what the actual motivations of Israel are. Students are really curious about these things um, because they also want to understand like the issues of today obviously and want answers to those things um, but there's also in talking about the resistance of Palestine making those connections to things that are happening in the United States um, it it's it was for my students the first opportunity they really had to really understand what global solidarity could look like um, and what global like actual revolution could potentially look like when we're looking at the ways that um, people are similarly still experiencing colonialism, imperialism, um, exploitation, uh, displacement, housing, housing demolition, removal of land, all of these issues that permeate every inch of this globe, right, from ongoing colonization to this day, 
Um, Palestine is a really interesting place to start um, because of the way that the U.S. authorizes it, but it's also an interesting way to get students to really make connections to themselves and their own experiences and make, experience, make connections to people all over the world. Um, so that's really what it, it was about for my classroom. Um, and it is also an important gateway to helping kids really see um, the reality of not being taught the truth in school. Um, I think when you're using Palestine as an example, it becomes so obvious that there was an intentional you know, level of misleading and an intentional level of misinformation in their curriculum um, that was trying to sway them in a particular direction. So I think seeing that so vividly then makes them question everything else that they've ever learned. Um, and they take that with them for the rest of their not just academic career, but for their lives. Um, and that's really what a lot of my own students have come back to say to me is that, you know, learning the truth about what is happening in Palestine has made them really rethink everything. So now they're really looking for the truth and seeking the truth of, of other marginalized groups all over the world. Um, so that's why I think it, it is so important. Um, it comes with its challenges, obviously, and, and it requires solidarity, it requires um, community work, it requires, um, you know, a level of, of bravery in, in being a teacher, trying to go about these, these types of conversations in your classroom. Um, but the impact does have a lifelong effect in, in my opinion and experience. Amazing. Um, Zausen, how about you? Um, what would you add to the question about why it's important for non-Palestinian kids to learn about Palestine in schools? Yeah, I think I touched on that a little bit, but I think when it comes to speaking to administrators and speaking to other teachers, which I do a lot of, I always talk about the interest convergence, right? Like we're living in a country where violence with guns, school shootings, we're the only country that has school shooting drills, right? And a lot of that comes from, and, and ironically, like the school shootings, 99% of school shooters are affluent white students. And so when we talk about inclusion work in general, that's inclusion work for everybody. It benefits every student and it makes our country safer. Whether you're a parent who has black or brown children or not, you're sending your kids to school and we all have a tangible fear of what that might be, what every school day looks like. Every time you know that your children are on lockdown, that's a very scary moment for us today. And it doesn't even have to be in a school setting. It has to be in public spaces. So many of the, the, the incidents that we're watching on the news today are driven by our race-based, right? And whether it's Arab or non-Arab, at the end of the day, when we talk about inclusion being done, inclusion work in schools being done authentically, that means we're seeing every single student, Palestinian student, Black student, Brown student, every student from every background. And so we have an interest, whether we are white, Black, Brown, or whatever way we identify, of doing this work and doing it well for us to create safer spaces in our country in general. And so we can't argue with, like, with all this anti-CRT push, with all this anti-racist work and all the laws that are being passed to silence these stories, we have to bring it back to the interest of people who are living here and why this work matters to every single one of us, whether you are a parent or just a community member going to a race or going to a public space, we have a tangible fear that we have to really consider. And the only real solution to that is not a Band-Aid. It, it's, it's doing inclusion work and making sure that every one of our kids in these spaces a, understands who they are, their own positionality, their own intersections of their identity and how that plays, and knows how to navigate those things, and then B, understands the people that they take space with. And recognizing that mobility is such a real thing in today's world, that means that I can take space with a certain group of people today and tomorrow that might look very, very different. And so as a teacher, my responsibility in teaching a social justice curriculum in schools and making sure that I transform and like Luma said, see every single one of my students really, is that I am exposing students to as many identities as possible. And so when we talk about like, a lot of people are like, well, how does that fit into my curriculum? And, and you know, kids are elementary ages are too young. I always say, well, if Ruby Bridges was eight when she experienced it, no kid is too young to talk about it. There's, that's not even an excuse. So we really need to look at our history and see that kids and youth movements have really transformed you know, history for the Black movement, for the Latinx movement, like we look at our own history as a country and really draw those connections, then we can't say that any child is too young because they're they're experiencing it. And so we need to start doing the work of unlearning and really bringing down that lens from a very young age in order for us to see that tangible difference with time. This is our long-term investment in education. And so that's my argument with a lot of teachers who push back. Like you as a teacher, as, an, as a citizen of this country, you have an interest in teaching this way. Let's put aside now like all of this like black and brown and elevating black voices, then we're being racist against whiteness, which is ridiculous, but 
let's put all of that on the side and, and let's just have a conversation about why this work matters. And I think that really gets a lot of people to put their arms down and just listen authentically because I don't think that there's anybody who's living in America today who works in a school or, or sends kids to school who doesn't have a tangible fear of what that could be, right? And we see these shootings happening all the time. And so when we really contextualize the conversation, I think it makes people more open to it. And I think really what kind of what Luma alluded to and what Muna alluded to is drawing intersections between the Palestinian cause and all the other things that kids are studying already and the things that they understand is so important because I think Palestine is so foreign, so foreign that even when I was living in Abu Dhabi and it was a three hour plane ride to Palestine, people didn't know the expats that I was working with who came from all over the world didn't know where Palestine was. So, and they were three hours away. So geographically, even when we're closer to it, there's just an intentional, an international intentional erasure. And so I think it's so foreign to them that when we can draw those connections and those interse intersections between the indigenous uh, population, the settler colonialism that exists in America from then, all of those different, the, the Black Black Lives Matter movement and the jail and the, the prison to the school to prison pipeline and how children are being jailed in Palestine as well. There's so many intersections that we can draw when we're talking about social justice and the fact that they really need to I think even with, with Arab kids, there's an assumption that Palestinian and Arab kids understand what solidarity looks like. They understand their own history, and that's not always the case either. So I think that there's a benefit in teaching kids across intersections about what does solidarity look like? What does it mean to be an equity advocate? And it starts with introspective work with the kids. Who are you? And why does this work matter to you? What are your intersections of your identity? And then it becomes of moving, like I have, we, we do learn first and it's very introspective and then we link. And we talk about how all of that work really links into all of these different, like celebrating different identities and different, um, the, the different kind of journeys and histories of different groups of people, but seeing oppression and tying that thread throughout. And then the last part of it is, now that I know, what am I going to do with what I know? How do I bring all that together as an anti-racist? And I call my students scholar activists because first it's about knowing, and then once you know, you have to act. How do you act and how do you start to shift the narrative? And it could be something as simple as, just really educating other people or you know, creating a piece of art or writing a poem or publishing a novel, right? All of these different things are putting information that is a counter story to the story that exists about who we are into the hands of larger communities. And so there's so much that we can do to really integrate Palestine across the board. But I think the gatekeepers who have a say in how that curriculum comes through or doesn't, and I was called anti-Semitic, I can't tell you the pushback sometimes isn't even the kids in the communities because I, work in a community that really loves, like Luma said, wants, and they're thirsty for this information, but the pushback comes from my colleagues, my Zionist colleagues. And so that's pushback. I was called anti-Semitic. I was called in to speak to. The fact that I'm Palestinian automatically means I'm anti-Semitic most, in most spaces, right? And so you're, you have to prepare yourself for pushback from administrators, from pushback from teachers, from pushback from students sometimes, and, and really prepare yourself with that. But that learning network that we create and, and kind of creating a sense of interest convergence and helping people to understand how this, really, this work really creates a safer space for everybody has to be the basis and the foundation for starting those conversations in schools, period. Uh, we have some questions we probably should get to. Um, Before we do, Faisal, yeah. can we just close with Mona? Sure. Anything that Mona wants to add? And then let's do questions uh, from the chat as well as uh, okay. folks who are here in person. Um, Mona, is there anything you wanted to add to this question about the um, non-Palestinian kids and why it's important for them as well? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add or, or you know, add to the conversation, the idea of these parallels that we can find, right? And that, you know, the most obvious ones that I've used in my classroom would be, you know, the struggle of the African-Americans, the civil rights movement, because a lot of our um, leaders and artists and writers were working at the same time of the civil rights movement. Um, we're getting arrested at the same time that Dr. Martin Luther King was getting arrested, right, in different parts of the world. Um, so definitely drawing those parallels. And, you know, um, there are certain topics that the rest of the world respects. For example, apartheid in South Africa. When I teach, when I'm about to teach a book like Tasting the Sky, I don't do it right away. You have to front load, like a lot of front loading happens um, before we can even start to use the word Palestine or to use, uh, you know, to, to use our own leaders, right? So a lot of front loading work. Um, you know, putting poems side by side, for example, someone like Maya Angelou with the caged bird um, by, you know, just to understand what does it look like to be an oppressed person? Um, and how can you still use your voice, even if you're in this type of 
cage or something like that, right? So, so just um, you know, making those parallels. Uh, and I also do teach history. So when we talk about colonialism and the idea of a land without a people for a people without a land, that's kind of like one of the question, the essential questions. What does that mean when you know leaders use these types of words and disregard indigenous people? like the Native Americans, right? So it's just these connections that can be made that really, no matter who you are, uh, you understand struggles like that. So then, you know, adding Palestine into the uh, equation will be a lot easier to understand for people who otherwise have no knowledge of it. I, I swear I would love to be a student in all of your classrooms. I mean that sincerely. Um, Faisal, what are some of the questions that... Yes, we have a question from Krista Bruin. Uh, you mentioned the challenges as Palestinians in being included in spaces of social justice work in the United States. How have the modification in the definition of anti-Semitism by the IHRA, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, affected your work as educators working for social justice in the United States, bringing Palestine into the classroom and creating safe spaces for Palestinian students in the classroom? Oh, that's such a good question. I mean, um, I'll, 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 I'll leave that uh, to others, but I just wanna say that pretty much um, almost all of my Palestine activism now is around the IHRA. So if folks aren't aware that the definition of anti-Semitism is being redefined uh, as a weapon against Palestinians. So whereas um, in the past, I think folks generally understood anti-Semitism to mean hatred of Jews and everyone ought to be against the hatred of Jews or the hatred of anybody. There's now a political movement that started around 2015 and has accelerated under Trump and continues to accelerate in the United States and globally to define anti-Semitism in ways that include the criticism of Israel, which means that Palestinians literally talking about their own lives, it's now an anti-Semitic to talk about, uh, about your own life. And um, this is um, a, a shocking development that as a Jew myself, I feel is not only harmful to Palestinians, clearly it is intended to harm Palestinians, but it's also harmful for Jews in a very historic way. Because if anti-Semitism includes the criticism of Israel, that means that supporting Israel is part of being Jewish. And that means someone like me who doesn't support Israel as a Jewish supremacist state is no longer Jewish. They're not just redefining anti-Semitism, they're redefining Judaism. So I really believe that Palestinians and Jews have a shared interest in opposing the IHRA redefinition of anti-Semitism. Um, and, and, and I'm sorry for taking so much time, but can who, who among, uh, among you would, uh, one of you would like to speak on that uh, before we get another question? Um, I mean, I can speak to it if, <laughs> if no one else wants to. Um, I don't think the most uh, disturbing thing about this shift is that, I, well, A, I wasn't really surprised by it, um, but I, it didn't feel different than what I was already experiencing. Um, so just as, as context, right, like even years ago before this shift, me introducing myself to somebody and them saying, where are you from? Me saying Palestine. I would immediately get a response from a complete stranger of, oh, so you probably want to kill me, right? Because I'm Jewish. Right? From a complete stranger who doesn't know anything about me. So this change in definition took something that was already happening um, to something that now can be weaponized against teachers in the classroom to be able to take an entire book, right, even the book that we're looking at here right in the middle and say, well, this entire thing is obviously anti-Semitic, so you can't put it in your classroom, um, which is why for our case in, in developing this curriculum for, for Nora, um, it's really important to include in these curriculum guides for teaching about Palestine ways to go around these sort of uh, red lines um, that you have as somebody trying to humanize Palestinians in your classroom um, and providing um, 
understandings of misconceptions about what it means to teach about Palestine um, and what it means to really be honest about what's happening, but also be realistic about the fact that the education system is not set up to have you have these conversations. Um, so it requires a lot of extra work to be able to do these things in the classroom um, and you have to you know, be strategic about it ahead of time. It is still possible, but yeah, it's taken something that was already happening and put it into, um, into actual words, so. I do have a, another question uh, from Michael Goodman. Uh, to what extent are you encountering resistance from the established organization representing the quote unquote Jewish community to any open discussion of this issue in the public schools? I don't think that there's pushback from any particular organization. I think there's just pushback in general. It's kind of like Luma said, it's 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 bipartisan universal support for Israel and people don't know the difference. And I think it's always been there. So formalizing it or having specific organizations that are against it, the general person does not know better. Like I, even in my work with OVA and I was in a room full of BIPOC uh, people from, from different marginalized backgrounds. And when I started to talk about Palestine, there wasn't a dry eye in the room because even people who are immersed in equity work who come from marginalized backgrounds, they just really don't know. So I think, I think that, you know, that lack of knowledge that's out there and the fact that this isn't the intentional erasure and the intentional silencing of this curriculum formally in all spaces really is taking effect in the fact that when you when people are in a space where they're able to have these conversations, especially with somebody whose lived experience it is, I, I have found that there is a receptive, for the most part, a lot of receptive people who want to learn. And I think it's just about creating space for them to have the opportunity to learn um, in educational spaces, which is why I talk about this in, in, to, in conferences all the time. When we're presenting, Muna and I are on a couple of panels, Nura and I are working together on a couple of panels next week. We have five different sessions that are primarily focusing on teaching Palestine and integrating Palestine curriculum moving forward. So I think that there's a lot of receptiveness for that, but currently I don't think that there's, there's any one organization that's like really working against it's the fact that this is just not a conversation that's happening so everybody's really against it for the most part it's just really general I want to jump in and just I want to jump in and say I, I'm not sure I, I fully agree with you so son I think there is an organization that's really taking the lead and I'm going to call them out every opportunity I can and that's the ADL the anti-defamation league is really spearheading um the um, racism against Palestinians and doing it in the name of anti-racism, which I think is particularly uh, effective and um, devious. And what I mean by that is that um, the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, has a wide, wide influence on schools in the United States. In some districts, they are a district-wide provider of anti-racism and equity uh, training. They have materials, they have teacher trainings, they have seminars. It's a very large, powerful educational institution. And one could argue that that their materials have value. I'm not gonna say they don't have value for some people in some ways, but embedded in that is such a virulent anti-Palestinianism. And because they do it as quote anti-racists, I personally call them out and I encourage folks to look at the website, drop the ADL and read more about the harm that the Anti-Defamation League is causing um, to Palestinians and to all of us um, in U.S. schools. I'm sure that there are others, but I think, I think they deserve a special award for the damage that they're causing and they've caused over decades. Uh, a question again from Krista to you, Nora. Could you also speak specifically about your experience raising your Palestinian children and their own experience identify, ident of identity having a Jewish mother. Also, do you know or are you aware of Um Forat, who writes about her experiences as a Jewish mother raising Palestinian children? Uh, I, I'm not aware of Um Forat, but I'll look her up. Um, and I'll answer this question, and then I think we should take some questions from folks here as well who may have questions or comments. Yeah, that's the last one here I have. So. Oh, okay. Um, 
So, you know, my girls grew up in Palestine and um, they grew up in Palestinian schools. So you get to either be Christian or Muslim. Those are your choices. Um, there's not an option to be mixed. There's certainly not an option to have a, a Jewish mother. Uh, I remember uh, my, my middle daughter, who's actually the inspiration, the original inspiration for this book, Ida in the Middle, was my middle daughter. Um, and I remember when she, uh, she uh, was in kindergarten and the teacher, the teachers would make a, an, an effort to always talk about Muslims and Christians. Uh, because there's a desire among Palestinians to, to have unity and to not allow differences in religion to cause any kind of intercommunal uh, issues at, as they shouldn't. So whenever the teacher would say Muslims and Christians, my daughter would say, and Jews, <laughs> which if you know the context of Palestinian schools is like just about the weirdest thing that you can do. Um, but she was like a little kid and, and, and they were like, uh, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, I think that, uh, um, I don't even know how to answer that question. It's such a hard question. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty much impossible to have, um, a healthy Jewish identity, um, when, when you're under any kind of Israeli control, you know, because they've, they've captured, the the religion and the religious symbolism they put stars of david on tanks on tanks so and airplanes and on airplanes um how how do you how talking do you, military airplanes right right we're talking about airplanes that kill people and and uniforms that kill people so it's a big and challenging issue. I mean, they're hijacking the Jewish religion basically yeah. for their purposes. I I don't I don't disagree with you. Yeah. I don't disagree with you. Another Jewish ISIS version mm -hmm. of ISIS. Mm -hmm. It's it's complicated, but in a way, it's um, it's really not complicated. I think what what I need to do and what I hope we all do is to just continually push back against the conflation of Judaism and Zionism. Judaism is a people with a history, with a religion, uh, sometimes a shared culture, um, and, and and Zionism is a political ideology that that's a colonial ideology and a Jewish supremacist ideology, and those two things are not the same thing. Um, now, helping kids, uh, Jewish kids, grow up with a healthy Jewish identity, given the the, the the hegemonic uh, the hegemony of Zionism in the United States is not easy, but I think that as long as um, American Jews and Palestinians in the United States and in Palestine continue to ally and act in solidarity the way I think we are, um, you know, we'll get somewhere. We'll get somewhere. Um, folks here, um, comments and questions, and sorry for keeping you for so long. Listening, please. Hi. Um, uh, if you could talk louder, so they hear you on here. Okay. And you probably um, need to repeat the I'll question. Repeat it shortly. Go ahead. So I'm asking this question as a former professional STEM tutor for high school students and potential future educator of science and math in various capacities. Also, someone hoping to weaponize whiteness and privilege to support struggle for liberation. So. My question is basically I appreciate and I've learned a lot about what you talk about from largely social studies um, and English um, classrooms, but I imagine there's applicability of a lot of what you're talking about to STEM. So my question is essentially like, do you have any thoughts on supporting Palestinian American students in STEM specifically and or changing STEM curriculums to contextualize especially given that the pipeline to software engineers, just like mechanical engineers to like the major US like software and weapons companies and given how Israel is one of the leading weapons exporters in the world, like that nexus of STEM knowledge leading to the production of technologies of oppression and the collaboration between US and Israel on that. And the way that STEM is so like, like obstacles for all marginalized groups to access that 
like sort of pipeline to those um, knowledges. Do you have any thoughts on that? That's an amazing, <laughs> amazing <laughs> question. I don't know if my arms open heard the question. Did you guys hear or no? Yeah, we did. Oh, okay. oh good. Okay. Right. Does anybody want to take it on specifically or again? Or... I have a general kind of, but you go ahead first, Mona, uh, Loma, if you have something. Sure. Um, I mean, I think you already spoke to it. An example of what can be done when it comes to science class or STEM classrooms in general. And um, say so what STEM is for those who aren't teachers. Science, technology, oh, what is engineering. it? Engineering and mathematics mm -hmm. <laughs> for those who don't know. Um, so asking you know, on the online to repeat the question. So I don't think everybody heard it. Maybe the participants. Yeah, you want to repeat the question for the. Yeah. Right. So making connections towards Palestine specifically in STEM classrooms um, and really being thoughtful to um, how curriculum can be changed in STEM classrooms when it comes to the issue of Palestine, how it can be included or gaps can be filled and things like that. Um, and looking at the kind of pipeline to, um, you know, looking at the reality of um, STEM professions and the way they are um, supporting the ongoing apartheid um, and creation of weapons and things like that, um, that continue the marginalization and, and colonization of Palestinian people. That was a full, was a full question, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think you spoke to an example already of how that can be done is really like noting that that exists in and of itself um, in terms of that connection between um, the United States, US tech and military technology um, and how it affects um, Palestinians who are under Israeli military control um, and other places, right? Really looking at the connections to other parts of the world. Um, you can really, you know, look at what's happening in Latin America, for example, and the way governments are destabilized there. Um, and the same types of weapons are used in Israel that are used in countries like Venezuela, for example. Um, so making these connections and parallels for students in terms of um, what this militarization, global militarization does um, is, is an important addition to curriculum. Um, I think collaborating with social studies teachers is like the simplest answer that I can give to that. Um, I know that it's not always easy as a science teacher. I have a really good friend who's a physics teacher and she tries to make these changes constantly. And it's really tough um, because you have such a regimented curriculum you have to follow. Um, and for a lot of supervisors, they don't understand why this is even relevant at all. Um, but what she has done in, in some cases is um, use uh, films um, that have those connections of um, science or tech um, to what is happening that marginalizes specific communities. Um, this isn't related to Palestine, but she's like hidden, hidden figures, for example, to understand racism in the U.S. Um, so she can make the argument that, oh, it's still connected to physics, though, so you can't, you know, reprimand me for using it. Um, but yeah, collaboration with social studies teachers and really looking for ways that you could um, even do joint lessons um, and really build on the lessons that are happening in your colleagues' classrooms uh, and having those conversations is not only going to make it more impactful for students when learning them, but it's also going to build that community of teachers who want to do this work with you. Um, so that would be my advice. Another thing that comes to my mind just to jump in is, is around surveillance. Um, I'm not a teacher, but uh, but I know that surveillance is something that very much concerns kids in the United States, uh, and that a lot of the surveillance technologies that are being used against communities of color in the United States um, are either being used in Israel or were developed in Israel and are being, these surveillance technologies are being used um, globally. Um, and I know that Visualizing Palestine has done some work on that and that some of the Visualizing Palestine infographics can be great to use yeah. in high school because it also teaches data literacy and in a, in a creative and attractive way and, and raises some of these issues around the globalization of surveillance, for example. Right. Um, is there, before, let me just get a, a show of hands, how many other comments we have. So we have at least one more. I wanna make sure everyone gets. So um, Sosin, do you want to, before we um, take what might be the last question, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, just really briefly, um, I was going to say like one of the biggest things that I've kind of talked to when I talk to teachers from different uh, different content areas is really the need to establish identity no matter what content you're teaching. And I always call it the first few weeks of school. Like I spend three weeks of school really just doing positionality work with my students at every level in every school I've taught in regardless of what content I've taught because it really creates community. And so I think that's really important. I think even just having students elevate their identities and voices, that's a really important thing to start with, especially if you have Palestinian kids in the 
classroom, that'll be a, a way to bring it in as just a conversational piece from a humanistic perspective. And the other thing was with technology today, having um, kind of like mentorship or people who are in positions that are like I bring in, for example, in my social justice curriculum, people from urban planning to talk about inequity in urban planning who are BIPOC people who are doing, we we'll call it name, notice, name, and interrupt. So who have noticed, named, and interrupted inequity in that, in, in finance, in mortgages, in all of these different things. So I think experts who are BIPOC people who can speak to some of these things and then drawing the connections because the reality is inequity exists everywhere and it's existing everywhere in Palestine too. So it's really easy to draw, whether it's the distribution of water, whether it's the way the land is divided, the, the land grabbing, or the wonderful things that the people in Gaza are doing in order for them to create using STEM so that they can survive in an open air gel with nothing. Like we've done projects on that. And how do they take, for example, the compacting and, and the debris in order for them to really use and, and be creative in order for them to survive and create things that they don't have access to. So all of those are different things that I think with technology today, you can even bring guest speakers into your class classroom from these different spaces to speak on these things. So we do in my classroom, we have lightning talks on Wednesdays. And every single Wednesday, we have a guest speaker from somewhere talking about something. And I think I had a student who really pushed back all of last year with the conversation in general. And it was after a few speakers that he wrote in his journal, and I have them journal a lot, he said, I get it now. So I think sometimes when you're the one that's doing the speaking as a teacher too, students are skeptical, but when they get to hear all of these different voices from around the world saying a lot of the same thing and drawing connections, and this is their profession and their life's work, all of a sudden they feel like they can't push back anymore and they see the validity in that. So I think technology really opens the door in classrooms to bring in some really, really authentic voices that can speak to some of these things versus having the kids kind of just read about it or listen to you talking about it. It might be something to consider. Amazing. I hope that's helpful. Um, what might be our last question? Sure. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much for this panel. I think it was, it was really you know, fascinating and insightful. Um, I am currently working in a school in Waterbury, and, um, which is you know, just down the road from here. Um, one of the things that really struck me about a lot of the stories that were being told about both you know, your experiences as students interacting with uh, your school systems and then as teachers sort of watching students um, interactions was how how similar some of the stories um, that um, a lot of you know Palestinian students were facing and the sort of infrastructure is that a lot of black you know specifically black students in my schools are facing and I think one of the things that I I sort of just because this is something that's been on my mind recently was was thinking is that how it, it sounds like a lot of interactions that were sort of set up in the, as schools were being, you know, quote unquote, desegregated to disempower both, both parents and families, but especially students in their own schools and in their own education, um, and teachers as well, um, are sort of being weaponized against um, Palestinian students and a lot of other sort of um, yeah. communities as well. Um, and so you had talked a lot about um, the sort of looking at what solidarity can look like. Um, I'm wondering what sort of on a structural level of getting students to be able to find their voices in their own education collectively, um, what you think educators can do to sort of get students to say, okay, look, like these, these structural um, you know, like school structures that are designed to stop you from being able to speak up about, you know, your experiences as a Palestinian or as somebody who's, um, you know, uh, black and growing up in the United States, for instance, uh, how can you all work together to challenge the fact that you're not allowed a voice in your own school? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Before we answer that question, yeah. Okay, let's repeat. Summarize, summarize. The question, and then I, I'm, I'm going to put some folks in the room on the spot. The question is about, uh, the question is about um, how can students work together to challenge the structures, yes, uh, that undermine their ability to speak out on the issues that they care about. So, we have Fordham SJP in the <laughs> house. So Fordham SJP is in the house. And if anyone should have a last word on this, is there anyone here that wants to talk to that exact issue? 
Yeah. And please, if, if if you would speak loud so they can yeah. hear you in, in fact, you want to turn it around so that they can hear you in your own voice because <laughs> Warden SJP yeah. um, has a very, very important uh, experience and learning for all of us on this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Microphones are underneath that. Just come right, right, stand next to the chair. Okay. Right here. Right okay. there on, on top. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so part of my JP, my name is Abdul. Uh, basically, when it comes to like, you know, challenging the administration, Fordham SJP uh, as an institution is a club within Fordham University, Lincoln Center specifically, that has uh, had a long history of uh, combatants and like a, what's it called? Co conflict with, between the administration and within the club. Um, SJP, specifically Students for Justice in Palestine, tackles uh, education about Palestinian issues and about um, really uh, global liber liberation movements like broadly. So um, in our attempts to be uh, you know, officially recognized within this administration, we've uh, received a lot of like pushback. Um, we went through a lawsuit that lasted four or five years uh and we lost so now we operate as a underground organization so considering all these uh you know blockades that prohibit us from being able to uh really educate students within uh, the college setting uh, about liberation about palestine about being palestinian about identity broadly um we are doing it in a very limited fashion and so uh, what we have come to, you know, uh, really find our, in within ourselves and our abilities to uh, talk and to uh, to to educate is that, you know, understanding that there are certain like uh, limitations from being uh, able to like understanding that there are limitations when we talk about Palestine and talk about liberation is uh, an understanding that regardless of the fact that there may be um, pushback, there's still you know things that you can do. You know, Fordham SJP still operates. We may not have funding, we may not have, uh, you know, a recognition, we may not be able to really, um, you know, extend and expand as much as we would like to. We still have a basis. We still have like um, people that we can talk to with our um, with our community. And I think that's really the, the, the thing that we should be looking towards is rather, is rather not our, uh, our conflict with administration, rather our solidarity within our community, right? So when you look inwards and you find um, those who are there and willing to help you and willing to give you the resources that you can need or uh, you can get um, to continue your talk on education is how we can, as a group, work on uh, solidarity and work on the global liberation movement, right? Like, obviously, this is, is, is quite hard to talk, as a Palestinian, to talk about my experience as, Pal as a Palestinian within the classroom within the um, you know like events that Fordham holds but as I build the community and solidarity you know with my own Fordham SJP um, we can expand it you know we can grow that outreach you know because it's not just me talking to uh, my group now it's my group talking to their groups and their people right and we come to a point where we could um, really recognize our own identities and how they intersect with the Palestinian identity you know so I think to put it plainly, to talk about like a, you know, how we can in conflict administration talk about identity is to look to your own communities and look to see what our community has for us. You know, and it's very, I guess, subjective and very dependent on the location, but there's always like solidarity within every institution. And Fordham SJP, even though you didn't win the official um, administration stamp of approval yeah. um you won and still have the official stamp of approval from all of the rest of us <laughs> and we're so glad that you're here um because of course we're talking about teachers today and teaching but it's all really about students and so it's a wonderful way i think to end uh this particular uh panel i'm so proud to be with you rockstar activist teachers, 
people, human beings. Um, and I want to say one thing that I have to say every time I do a book talk, because Ida in the middle, I of course want you to, you can sign up in the raffle to win it and you can buy it. You can buy it anywhere where books are sold, including here today at the museum. But this book should be a gateway book, like a gateway drug. If you're interested in Palestine, don't just read my book because I'm not even Palestinian. There are Palestinian books written by Palestinians. Read my book, but read those books also, uh, because at the end of the day, um, while the current space for Palestinians is not, it, it's like white space. There's, there's not enough voices standing up for Palestine and for Palestinians. Soon, hopefully, those spaces will be filled up by Palestinians themselves, and books written by white American Jews won't be um, necessary. Um, I, I hope that my children's stories, which are included in this book and my experiences as a mom of Palestinians, um, are also kind of a gateway entry for those who, who, for whom um, who need uh, maybe a, a couple of, of uh, a ramp, a ramp into the subject. But uh, okay. thank you so much, um, Dr. Sousan Jabir, Mona Mustafa, Loma Hassan, um, brilliant educators, and to you, Faisal, for hosting us today and for all your support for this book and for my other books Sir, you've got the closing. It's your show. <laughs> well, I'd just like to thank uh, everyone who joined us today on uh, through Zoom uh, remotely, as well as those on Facebook. And thank uh, our uh, studio audience here. Uh, thank you for uh, participating. And uh, thank you uh, to the um, rock star panelists, as mm -hmm. uh, you refer to them. And Nora, thank you for the one being, being behind this whole thing, you know, with the book. I mean, it takes a book to uh, raise a village. <laughs> and we need your voice. So you keep saying, hopefully your book won't be necessary, but it's like Malcolm X said, every voice is necessary when it comes to solidarity work. So we appreciate the work that you're doing and everybody in the room, you know, if there's any way that you can contribute, obviously every voice matters because there's certain people who will never listen to me, Luma or Mona. They will only listen to people like you, Nuda. So we appreciate it. It's really to be a part of the toolkit. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to ask, how can we get in touch? And yeah, how can you? Well, Nora, we have a question about how folks can stay in touch. Those of you here personally or um, virtually, uh, every single one of us um, has uh, contact information. We're all on Twitter. Three of us are on Twitter. You could always, you could always email the museum. Yeah. Uh, info at palestinemuseum.us. This book, I didn't. And then I can. Yeah. I'll, I'll redirect. This book, Ida in the Middle, has its own website, idainthemiddle.com. I have my own website, noralestomara.com. Um, both of those you Restinmyshade.com. Yeah, Rest in My Shade <laughs> also has its own. Uh, and so does I Found Myself in Palestine, all my books. But uh, you can sign up for um, newsletters to get ongoing information about the educational materials that Loma and her uh, rock star colleague are uh, developing and other teachers around the country. Um, so do definitely do reach out and keep in touch. And I can also yeah. network you to take my business card that has the museum web, web website on it and add yourself to the email list on our website. So you'll get two emails a week telling you about two events every week uh, that you can join remotely or come in person sometimes yeah. like this one. Thank you so so much, everybody. It's really fun. Thank you, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna let people go because the, we we've kept them a while. So thank you so much, people. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Ma'asalama. Bye bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>